Hines. I'm the Addiction Medicine Fellow at the Boys of VA. Hello, and I'm Kate Heil. I'm the Full Circle Health Addiction Medicine Fellow in Boise and Nampa, and we are both family medicine trained. Awesome, thank you. Uh, all right, at this time, Andrew, I am going to turn it over to you. I will pull up your slides and give you control. All righty. So uh, today talking about uh, fentanyl and how that kind of relates to our medication assisted treatment since fentanyl is everywhere and uh, it can make things a little bit tricky. So Hopefully this will be a nice kind of primer for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about it. There we go. I have no disclosures. I am a fellow. All right. Overall learning objectives. Um, you know, being able to describe kind of the unique characteristics of fentanyl and why this can make initiating MAT tricky uh, would be good. You know, risks of precipitated withdrawal with MAT induction in fentanyl users and uh, kind of describe some of the methods for MAT and fentanyl that have been found to be successful in some of the literature, which we will talk about. All right, so starting off, what is fentanyl? Uh, highly potent synthetic opioid. Um, it was originally developed um, and pretty much only used in anesthesia uh, a number of years ago. The government kind of saw it, said, oh, this is kind of scary. We'll just leave it there. It had some good kind of cardiac stabilizing features for surgery, but then over time, we figured out that uh, it can be pretty useful for kind of treating pain, um, and especially kind of in cancer pain in like the outpatient or inpatient setting. Um, I was just kind of looking it up, and it is amazing how many different forms it has been available in. There's patches and tablets and nasal sprays and injections and lozenges. And there's a, oh, and popsicles, yeah. <laughs> there's all kinds of different ways that fentanyl um, kind of can be prescribed. And then you have the kind of more street side of things where it's more just kind of powders and tablets. So why is it such a problem? Um, it is super cheap and easy to make. Um, it's extremely potent. So the kind of smaller amount goes a lot further. And uh, because of that, it is now pretty much in everything because people kind of adulterate uh, the other drugs which are more expensive and complex to make with fentanyl. And a lot of people don't necessarily kind of know the difference and you really can't tell the difference because white powder is pretty much white powder. All right, so a little bit of pharmacology. So as I said, extremely potent. Uh, basically, you know, a milligram of fentanyl is equal to 100 milligrams of uh, morphine is kind of the rough standard kind of um, equivalents we use, although depending on the form, that can range anywhere from kind of a 50 to one up to even close to, I think, to like 200 to one I saw written in at least one of the papers I was looking at, but 100 to one is a good kind of standard ratio you can use. Um, it is a very uh, lipophilic me medication, which means that it likes to kind of seed out into the fat tissues, and this leads to kind of a high volume distribution. Um, and something else that's kind of interesting about it, um, it's highly active on what's called the beta arrestin pathway. So when you're activating those mu opioid receptors, there's a couple ways that uh, they become activated. And the beta arrestin pathway is believed to actually be responsible uh, primarily for the respiratory depression in patients. So this is particularly active on uh, the beta arrestin pathway, which is what makes it so incredibly dangerous. All right, so what does this mean for uh, kind of Suboxone MAT in general? Uh, it can make things a little bit more tricky when we are looking to get patients uh, start about things due to that lipophilic nature. Um, basically the fentanyl sticks around a lot longer, um, even after the last use. So it uh, kind of gets injected or smoked, however the case may be, makes its way into the brain, makes its way out of the brain, and then makes its way out into all the different adipose tissues. Um, so basically, uh, even after you haven't used it for, say, I don't know, I'll just say like eight hours or so, you're going through withdrawal. If you've been a chronic heavy user for a time now, um, it's still actually activating those mu opioid receptors. But just due to the kind of down regulation of the receptor activity, you know, the individual is not experiencing kind of the high from it. They're actually starting to go through withdrawal, but there's still a baseline level of activation that is happening. Um, 
and as I describe a little bit later, this can actually cause kind of an increased risk for precipitated withdrawal, even if a patient is already actively withdrawing. Um, one of the studies I was kind of taking a look at uh, by Varshenia uh, found that uh, in their kind of patient population, uh, use within her last use within zero to 48 hours actually led to a rather significantly increased chance of precipitated withdrawal in these kind of chronic fentanyl users. Um, the up to 24 hours was really kind of like the biggest window. I think in their paper, they said it was somewhere close to 36% of patients could experience precipitate withdrawal um, if started on kind of like a standard dose um, suboxone and that did decrease pretty significantly up to 48 hours and even up to 72, there was a little bit of a chance. Um, so it can make things difficult is I guess the moral of that story. Um, I already talked about this a little bit, kind of the precipitate withdrawal. It's that fentanyl out to the tissues, then coming back into the bloodstream, activating those receptors, even at a low level. Um, and basically what can happen, um, especially if you have a chronic user, it's only been a few hours since their last use, they're experiencing withdrawal. If you give them buprenorphine, um, they can actually kick those fentanyl molecules off that are providing that baseline level of stimulation. Um, which all of a sudden you have no opioids effectively um, kind of stimulating that or uh, at a much lower level, I should say, uh, and that can lead to that precipitate withdrawal. So that sounds less than excellent. Uh, what do we do about this? And the good news is that Suboxone is still a very viable form of treatment for these patients. Um, and it's nice because you don't have to go to like an OTP um, kind of specialized center for it. It can be started in like a primary office or the emergency room or anything like that. Um, but we have to kind of think a little bit more about how we are kind of starting this medication, um, especially in the age of fentanyl. And if a patient tells you like, yes, I have been using fentanyl, you know, we, we look at it a little closer and we kind of modify things. So there are kind of three different um, methods I will be describing in this presentation. Um, you know, it's difficult to kind of get head-to-head -head studies on these kinds of things. So we're going off a lot of kind of case studies, um, kind of smaller studies at single institutions, and all of them have kind of reasonable successes, but uh, you know, which one is the best, I can't rightfully say. I'm just kind of throwing these out there for kind of your consumption and kind of thinking about them. Uh, so the first one is the low dose induction. Uh, used to be called microdose induction that had some kind of connotations for hallucinogens. So we've changed it to low dose induction now. Um, and this can be useful in patients who really cannot tolerate any form of withdrawal. They say, doc, I'm going to continue using. If I stop using for even a few hours, it's awful. I can't deal with it. Um, and the way this works is you use those very kind of small doses of buprenorphine to start, and then you ramp it up over the course of a week. Um, the idea being that you're basically slowly replacing uh, the fentanyl molecules on all of those receptors to the point where eventually due to the nature of buprenorphine because it is uh, has such a high affinity for those opioid receptors that you've replaced and filled most of those receptors with uh, buprenorphine and even when a patient uses sentinel it's not able to really overcome those um, and that uh, by doing that kind of slow replacement, you don't really precipitate any withdrawal because you're not really adding enough each time to kick all of them off. You're just slowly kind of taking them off there. Um, and there is good success with patients um, with this low dose induction. The only downside um, is oftentimes patients have to continue to use uh, street drugs during this time. Um, unfortunately, in this country, we are unable to prescribe other opioids to help out with their kind of withdrawal management uh, because that can land you in jail. Um, there are countries like uh, Canada, actually just north of us, so they will actually bridge patients um, kind of using this low dose induction and then will prescribe uh, things like morphine or dilated to kind of keep the rest of the withdrawal at bay um, at the same time. Pretty neat stuff, but we unfortunately are unable to do that here in the United States. So 
what those kind of a low dose induction look like. Um, this is something I have seen in the literature. It is something I have used myself um, without precipitating any kind of withdrawal in my patients. And it's kind of a start off real low and then you ramp up pretty quickly. So day one, single dose, 0.5 milligrams buprenorphine. Your patient's not gonna notice this at all. It's just getting a little bit of those molecules onto those opioid receptors. Day two, you can kind of double that up and then you just kind of progress to day six. Uh, you're looking at eight milligrams of buprenorphine BID. At this point, you have a pretty good receptor saturation um, of those buprenorphine molecules. So you're getting a little bit of that protective factor. Um, the fentanyl that the patient's using isn't going to be really doing as much. And the idea being day six, patient be completely off fentanyl and they're not going to go through withdrawal anymore because they already have a good baseline activation now of those buprenorphine molecules on those new receptors. Um, another method is the high dose induction. Um, and this is more useful for patients who are already in withdrawal. Um, if you have a patient coming in not in withdrawal, I would not recommend kind of just immediately bombing them with buprenorphine. It's not going to go well. Um, and most frequently I see, at least in the literature, that this is done more in the emergency department setting. Um, although we actually did this uh, over here in our residential setting. Um, because a couple months ago now uh, with good success. And the idea is um, you have a patient, they come in, they're in withdrawal, been using fentanyl, you use larger doses of Suboxone uh, to ideally get a patient's um, withdrawal under control quickly. And basically, unlike with kind of the small dose induction, with the kind of high dose induction, you're looking to just flood all of those mu opioid receptors with buprenorphine, get them activating them at least partially, and that this will kind of take over the role that that kind of baseline activation of fentanyl was providing for the patient, and then more so on top to actually stop the withdrawal. Um, for a lot of the papers I was looking at, uh, these kind of hospital emergency departments seem to have pretty good success. Uh, this one particular study by Herring et al. found that less than 1%, it was actually 0.8% to be precise, of patients experienced uh, precipitated withdrawal in their emergency department using this method. Uh, which is pretty darn good. Um, I think the only criticism I kind of had of the study is they didn't really kind of dive into how long it had been since last use. They went purely based upon kind of the opioid withdrawal scale. Um, so it would have been nice to have that just kind of extra piece of data to see if there's any correlation with kind of time after use and maybe did that cause like these patients to have that withdrawal, that very small amount. Um, and what this particular study did, their induction was, if a patient came in, had a cow score of 8 to 12, they would use 4 milligrams of buprenorphine. If they had a cow score of greater than 12, it would be 8 milligrams of buprenorphine for their initial dose. Some other studies I've seen, they just kind of use 8 milligrams more blanket across the board, even if the cow score was between 8 and 12, um, roughly same success rates. And the idea would be uh, you'd reassess every 30 to 60 minutes. Um, if you have patients who have developed withdrawal or that just hasn't been under control with that initial dose, you give another between, this is a large window of eight to 24 milligrams of buprenorphine uh, at that next um, evaluation up to a maximum dose of 32 milligrams total for that um, initial day there. And then you kind of reassess again and see how they're going. Um, and, you know, once again, like they seem to have very positive studies for, or not studies, uh, results in this particular trial that I was kind of reading, you know. Um, is it safe to use kind of in more of an outpatient setting? I would think so. It's just a lot of clinics aren't necessarily set up to kind of house patients for multiple hours at a time. Uh, but if you had a clinic capable of doing that, where you could have people kind of checking in on them, this could be a viable option. And then the third one I'm going to talk about today is the kind of quote unquote modified standard induction. Um, and this is based on uh, a couple of small kind of case series uh, looking at this modified induction uh, for patients. And this particular one by uh, Antoine et al. looked at patients who were actually able to make it 48 hours since their last use of fentanyl. And what they did is instead of starting at kind of like the you know, normal four milligrams is they said, hey, let's start at a slightly smaller dose of two milligrams and kind of see how this works, keep them around and reassess every kind of 60 minutes to kind of see what's going on. 
Um, and what they found, at least in their particular uh, kind of case series here, is that patients did really well um, on this. And it was a small case series. We're talking, I think there were like three or four people, and there's a few other uh, case studies out there, also about three or four people that have shown this to work. Um, and they theorized that the reason this worked um, is due to kind of the pharmacology of buprenorphine itself. Um, you know, there's some literature out there that can take about 60-ish minutes to kind of have like the full effect of that partial agonist like working on those opioid receptors. And then by starting off lower, um, you know, you replace a few of those fentanyl molecules that have been hanging out with the receptors. Uh, which could, you know, potentially activate maybe a little bit of withdrawal, but you give that buprenorphine a chance to actually start to act on the receptors, you get that baseline kind of activation going, and then you start to add more buprenorphine on top of that to better control their withdrawal. Um, and they think that by doing this, you could potentially reduce the chance of precipitating withdrawal because you at least have a little bit of that baseline activation going again after that 60 minutes. Um, so that was an interesting one I saw. I haven't personally done this with a patient yet. And then the question, uh, what if buprenorphine just isn't working? Um, you tried it, patient's not doing well, they don't want to try it. Uh, good news, we still have methadone. It is still very useful for all patients uh, kind of with opioid use disorder. It is very useful in patients with uh, opioid use disorder, specifically using fentanyl. Um, you can refer them to an outpatient treatment or, or an opioid treatment center, and they can work to get that uh, methadone kind of up and running. Um, based on my literature review, just kind of based upon the affinity of methadone, you're not really going to precipitate withdrawal in a patient by giving a methadone. And regardless, you are limited to how much you can start on the first day anyway, so patients don't really have a problem with that. Downside being, it takes time to ramp them up, and depending on how much fentanyl they're using, they can require particularly high levels of methadone in order to get things under control. So, uh, you know, in the meantime, in my experience, kind of having seen this at a methadone clinic, is patients will oftentimes continue to use their opioid of choice while we're in the process of ramping up that methadone. Um, so not, you know, there is no perfect solution, but uh, certainly if suboxone buprenorphine is not working, get them to a methadone clinic. Um, and then there are just some of those patients who just have better success with methadone. Um, and that's just kind of how it goes based on their individual kind of physiology. So key points, um, fentanyl, it's in everything. It's cheap to make, super easy to smuggle compared to kind of the large quantities that you need to smuggle in for cocaine. It's likely here to stay. So it is something you're going to have to continue working with and treating over time. Uh, the lipophilic nature of fentanyl makes precipitate with precipitated withdrawal a concern, um, even potentially 24 to 48 hours after last use. And there are different methods for buprenorphine induction that can help uh, mitigate these risks and get patients to a much safer place um, than continuing to use street drugs. And with that, just some references for your enjoyment, I guess. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm sure we can probably open up the floor to that. So I've got a question, Andrew. Um, this is uh, Todd Palmer. Uh, so, yeah, obviously we we can't use fulmio agonists um, like they can in Canada, but if they're having pain, um, you know, it's, it's a way around that, right? You can use fulmio agonists that are in pain, but then of course you you know you you run the risk of using those fulmio agonists while they're if they continue to take fentanyl, so it's a little risky. Mm -hmm. uh, will, will people do that as an outpatient, or do they want to be an inpatient? But um, there, I, I just wanted to bring up that scenario that you know it can be done if the patient is having if they if they're if they're having chronic pain as well or even acute pain. Um, yeah, you legally you can't do that. Yeah, and I, I should have mentioned that, but I didn't. But yes, if they have an actual pain indication, the Harrison Act no longer applies. You can definitely work around it and kind of treat them with a full agonist. But yeah, as Dr. Fong mentioned, like could be a little tricky if they are continuing to use kind of fentanyl or street drugs. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of these patients can have, you know, a lot of these patients do have pain. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I would just encourage people, you know, if they are going to, um, you know, have have the patient continue to use their street fentanyl while you're doing that low dose induction, you know, I'd just be very clear in your notes that, um, uh, you know, you 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 present all other options, and 
they they basically declined everything else. And um, you know, you're I mean, you're not totally you're you're not to condoning them using street fentanyl, but um, you know, nothing else is is happening, and um, this is all you've got. Um, so you just have to protect yourself uh, in your in your charting, and make make it clear that this is the patient's choice to continue using the low dose continue using street fentanyl while they're doing a low dose induction, um, and um, because you know who knows what they're getting on the street, and you know we, we don't we don't like condoning people getting getting street drugs, and especially when fentanyl's involved, um, think there can be bad things happening. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Todd, and thanks, Andrew, for a great presentation. Um, let's open it up to everyone. What questions, thoughts do you have for Andrew or for our panel on this topic? I guess since no one's asking a question, I'll ask you, Andrew. Um, you know, I've heard of some programs with a high dose View where they're, they're they're actually using sixteen initially. Um, yeah, and I have kind of briefly read that as well. Um, I think it was just the particular studies that there seemed to be a few more of them was more kind of starting at eight, but um, you know, with the safety profile, I guess, of uh, buprenorphine compared to you know, all other opioids for the most part. So your risk of respiratory depression is definitely a lot less. Um, so, you know, I think depending on how bad the withdrawal is and I guess good old gestalt, um, if you felt that 16 milligrams was really the way to go and that that would help this patient, you know, I, so long as you can monitor them, I don't think it would be the wrong choice necessarily. Other questions? Do our panelists? Oh, Neil, go for it. I apologize. I had to take a phone call, and so this may have been asked, and I uh, didn't hear it. But uh, regarding the micro induction or the the low dose induction, what is your standard uh, follow up with the patient during that week that they are initiating their low dose induction? Do you see them every day? Do you have a phone conversation with them every day? Do you just say, here's, do you give them a written instruction, say, uh, you know, follow this, I'll see you back in a week? How, how do you, what's your follow up look like? Yeah, good question. Um, so I definitely do give them a handout, um, mm -hmm. kind of explaining exactly how much I want them to take and when I want them to take it. Um, and typically, the way I've been able to do it, um, this was kind of more in residency when I was pulling this off, so my schedule was always slammed. I was able to see them like every other day over the course of the week um, and kind of check in or at least do a phone call with them to see how they were doing. And that seemed to work pretty well. Um, you know, they were kind of a little bit miserable during the entire process because that, you know, they were trying to like remain away from heroin, but also using heroin. And this was more when heroin was still available in Michigan <laughs> for this particular patient, but same rules apply. Um, so personally, I would check in with them a few times over the course of the week. And then the next week, I would probably have another follow up to better fine tune exactly what I wanted their overall suboxone dose to be. And one uh, kind of corollary question too. Um, during the low dose induction, have you found adjunctive medications like clonidine, zofran, and so forth to be helpful or not necessary? Um, well, that uh, kind of depends on what the patient is doing. You know, if they tell me that I am absolutely going to continue using at my same level of like heroin or fentanyl, whatever the case may be, you can definitely recommend and prescribe those kind of adjunctive medications. My patient never took them um, because he continued to take or use heroin. Um, and if you have a patient who, you know, is actually kind of getting to the point where they are starting to withdraw and actually they are choosing not to use any kind of fentanyl or anything like that, that might actually be kind of a conversation to have with maybe we switch you mm -hmm. away from that low dose induction to get closer to like a standard induction um, and get this over with quicker. Um, yeah, the low dose at least kind of how we've seen it 
used, it's really not for the patient who is in withdrawal. It's for the one who can't stand it and is just going to continue using at their normal dose. Yeah, that's kind of the trick is to use the same amount um, as what they have been using previously, like mm -hmm. their typical amount. Um, and we do this with um, chronic um, pain meds as well, chronic opioids. Um, so we encourage them, or we have them take the exact same amount that they have been taking, you know, like Percocet tens four times a day or whatever. We, they continue that amount as we're switching them over to Spox. I make a quick comment. Um, uh, Neil, the other thing you can do, you know, um, I mean, I, I would be reluctant to do this with, with this fentanyl patient getting fentanyl on the street, but like someone yet you're converting from methadone to bupe, you can actually take a break too. You don't have to continue with that same schedule, you know, with the increase every day of, of the bupe, right? Um, you can give them a plateau day or maybe two. Um, they talk about people that are on, you know, very high dose doses of methadone that you're converting to bupe and doing low dose induction work. You know, it takes a, it, it can take longer, quite a bit longer. Um, so, you know, nobody, no one's to say that you have to do that, you know, march along and increase it every day. You can plateau it out. But again, with, with fentanyl, getting fentanyl on the street, obviously I wouldn't do that um, because you want, you want the process to occur as quickly as possible. Thank you. I mean, it relates to your question about using adjunctive meds, you know, it, if they're withdrawing, then you know, maybe you're going up too quickly on the bupe and you need to plateau. So yeah, they can kind of compound the picture a little bit. Okay, thanks. We've got time for a few more questions, if anyone's got any. All right, and Kate and Andrew, anything else that you guys want to cover? Uh, I think it's about what I had prepared for today. Awesome. I just I just wanted to point.